Hello friends, welcome back. Today I'm going to be sharing my testimony with you and I have never shared my testimony with anyone ever. I've shared parts of my story here and there with different people, but I've never shared my entire testimony. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. I have heard a lot of people in my life talk about the peace and love of God and I never knew how deep those words were until I experienced it for myself. Because until you experience it for yourself, they're just words. And you can imagine, but all you have to go off of is things that you've already experienced. So the peace and love and joy that the world brings is kind of what you compare it to and kind of how you view it. But let me tell you, friend, it is beyond that. The peace and love and joy from God is far above the world's perception of it. I wasn't one of those lucky people that grew up in a loving Christian family and served the Lord my whole life and never really had any troubles. There are a few people out there like that and I wasn't, I wasn't one of those. I did grow up and learn about God and I knew the Lord because all through my life, he showed me himself. He showed me how much he loved me, even though I wasn't always paying attention. In the beginning, I was conceived out of an affair I'm the product of an affair. Um, and that was something that was told to me multiple times as a child. And as a child, it's funny how kids kind of take the blame for things, even something like that. I carried shame with that. I carried guilt over that somehow. I don't know how, and that might sound really strange, but I had shame and guilt over that, even though I had no control over it, and I am so glad that I'm here. After I was born, I went to live with my grandparents, and in my family that was called Momo and Popo. That's what grandparents were called. So I lived with Momo and Popo, and I was very, very attached to Popo. So I thought I would share a quick photo with you of me and Popo together. That was my security. That was, I, I felt safe and loved and I was learning about Jesus. Actually, I have memories, very early memories of being like, I remember sitting in a high chair and my grandma, Momo, standing over me singing Peter, James, and John in the sailboat. And that was a, I don't remember the whole song, but I, it was a Sunday school song. And she was doing the hand motions, Peter, James, and John in the sailboat, out in the deep blue sea, here came Jesus walking on the water. <laughs> okay, I, I remember sitting in a high chair and remember Momo singing that to me. But I was very attached to Popo. And this is my mother's, parents, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, and my grandpa, Popo, is full blood Cherokee. So his family is from Oklahoma and Momo's family is from Washington. I think they're originally from Arkansas because she had a very strong accent. And I, I think of her in my mind and I can hear her cute little accent. So around three, I, I'm guessing that's around how old I was. My mother came to get me to come and live with her. And life there changed. Um, I had a little sister. My sister is two years younger than me. We have the same mother, same father. And my mother, uh, my mother was very attached to my sister and there was a lot of favoritism. Um, as an adult, I've found out that it, it, it's a, 
it's a certain family dynamic where there's a scapegoat child and a golden child. And I am the scapegoat child. So I don't know if you know anything about that. The scapegoat child is the bad one and all of the negative is put on that child. All of the blame for everything, uh, all of the bad is put on the scapegoat child and everything good is put on the golden child. So they are treated very differently. Um, and I think, and this is just my personal opinion as an adult looking back on it, I think that because my mother and her three sisters had childhood issues of their own, I think that there may have been jealousy on my mother's part for my grandpa's favoritism of me because I was his favorite. Um, there were other grandchildren and this was something that was commonly known in my family. Um, my family was very close and all of my aunts and uncles and cousins, we all did everything together. So my sister and I grew up like siblings with our first cousins. We were always all together and did everything together. So they were like my siblings as well. So it was commonly known that Popo and I had a bond and um, even my, my cousins, if they knew, if they wanted to ask for something, they would send me because they knew he might tell them no, but he wouldn't tell me no. So um, I had security in that. He was, he was my security. But like I said, there was issues with um, my mother and I actually felt attached to her, but I think she didn't necessarily feel attached to me, which I understand. I lived those early childhood developmental years with my grandparents and she had my sister and my sister had always lived with my mother. So there was, you know, probably more attachment between them and that's logical. Um, as of today, I actually educate people on attachment issues. So I, I, I fully understand. Um, but as a child, I didn't know the, these things. I didn't understand why I was the bad one, why she never got in trouble why I was always the one in trouble. Um, there are actually a few key things that I remember. I do feel like there's key things in everyone's life where you remember, and those are the things that shape your view of the world around you, other people and relationships with other people, and how you view yourself. So those key things in my life I was learning to not like myself. I really, I really didn't like myself. And I couldn't even put a finger on why, because I didn't know why I was bad. I just knew that I was the bad one. So through those childhood years, I, there was a lot of, there was a lot of things that were said that really stuck in my mind and a couple of those things were my sister and I were both told multiple times growing up that our family had a curse on it and that witchcraft ran in our family. And not only did it run in our family, but we were told that witchcraft will follow generations and be passed down through generations. And like I said, you know, these were things that we were told over and over and um, that it had came from the Indian side of our family. Uh, my grandpa, Popo, was, and his siblings were raised by his grandparents because his parents had passed away. I guess his grandpa was a Baptist preacher and his grandmother, it was a step-grandmother, she was a witch. And there was all these stories how she used to call owls to the windows and scare the kids and all of these things happened. Um, there was lots of stories of that was told to my sister and I growing up um, about 
not only things that happened like that in our family history, but also it seemed like my mom always lived in a haunted house. <laughs> and, you know, these things that would happen in these houses, she would tell us about these things too. And I remember her telling me um, when I was little, she would be giving me a bath and I would, I would always be looking behind her and sometimes I would scream. And it was as though I had seen things, I could see things that were there that she couldn't see. All of these little things was kind of setting me up for, well, if witchcraft, if curses and witchcraft and things run in our family and it follows generations, it's obviously going to come to me because I'm the bad one. And I knew it was it was a constant reminder. And I, I just have a little story here of, as an example of how I was the bad one. Um, actually, I'll, they'll, I'll share two stories. Um, one time we were at Momo and Puppel's house and they had one of those really big TVs that sat on the floor and everyone was in the living room watching the Barbara Mandrell show. And the adults were sitting around talking, watching the show as kids. It was me and my sister and a couple of cousins. We were all laying on the floor on our stomachs, you know, with our hands, head and hands, face and hands, watching the Barbara Mandrell show. And I remember there was a singer, somebody was singing, and I don't remember if it was a man or a woman, but somebody was singing and out of the blue, out of nowhere, my mother says, I know what you're thinking, Tina. And I turned around, Every actually everyone turned around and looked at her. No one said anything and I knew better than to say anything because it just wouldn't have gone well for me if I would have said anything. I remember thinking to myself, what was I thinking? Whatever it was, it must have been bad, but I don't know what I was thinking. Was I even thinking anything? I don't know. But that was just a, one of those seeds that was planted in me multiple times. There was multiple things that would happen that those seeds were being planted in me that I was a bad one. And I didn't know why I was bad, but I was bad. So this hate that was growing in me was mostly because I didn't know what it was that I was doing wrong. I, I couldn't change it if I didn't know what it was. As I got older, I would periodically go and live with my grandparents again. And they were my security. That's where I learned who Jesus was. That's who I, that's where I learned that Jesus loved me. And I didn't necessarily know what that meant. I could compare being loved by Puppo. That was my only example of what it felt like to be loved. So when I was with Puppo, or even if we were just visiting, that is the only time that I really felt safe. Um, I, I didn't have I didn't have to walk on eggshells. Even if I messed up, he would still love me. Even if I disobeyed, he would still love me. Um, and he would reward me and he would take time with me. So I knew what it was to be loved, but I didn't know what it was to be loved by Jesus because he wasn't right there in the room with me. You know, as a child, I, I heard that he loved me, but at, at one point, my grandpa had a heart attack and was life lighted. Um, we lived, lived in Washington State and he was life lighted to, I think, Seattle. So I was very young at this point. Um, I, don't, I don't remember how old I was, but he was life lighted and I just remember everyone telling me, to pray for Popo. And he, he had died multiple times and they had resuscitated him. And that 
was the first time that I encountered God. So I remember going outside by my swing set and looking up in the sky. I, I remember exactly what the sky looked like. And I remember praying for God to please not take my popo away from me. And I felt him. I, I felt, I felt an assurance that my prayer was heard and that it would be answered. The Lord was teaching me even then to bring him my worries and trust him with it to give it to him and trust him. And Popo came home from the hospital and he, he had told us stories about what he had seen when he had died. And he was climbing a mountain and he said it was a very hard mountain to climb and someone was climbing it with him. And when they got to the top, he said the person pointed way over there was a beautiful, bright, sparkling, bright, shiny city. And they told them that he's going there, but that he couldn't go there right now. He had to go back. I'm glad because... I had him for another 15 years. After Mount St. Helens blew in 1980, my family moved to Oklahoma. Like I said, that's where my grandpa was from. Growing, in a, growing up in Oklahoma was amazing. And even though there was, you know, troubled parts in my childhood, I can look back on my childhood and say I had a good childhood. I loved my childhood. Um, when we moved to Oklahoma, there was a lot of being outside and um, from sunup till sundown, me, my sister, my cousins, we were all outside. You know, there was points in my life still where the Lord was always there. He was always, he always showed up. And yes, I had a hard time, but I can look back and say he always showed up. And there were highlights that stood out to me. I remember when I was nine years old, I got to go to church camp and it was for a week. And it was amazing. My relationship with the Lord took a step forward during that church camp. I received the Holy Spirit. Um, I want to explain the camp itself. It was like how you picture camp in a movie or something. We all had cabins and there were groups of us in the cabins and there was a little trail by a creek. <laughs> it was perfect, a little wooden bridge and a big tent set up outside, open tent. So we would actually go to a cafeteria for lunch and dinner and breakfast. And then every single night, I mean, during the day there were activities, there were arts and crafts and there were um, comedians and different activities, um, hiking and stuff. But every single night there was preaching and it was focused towards kids. We would all go to this tent at night, like an old fashioned tent meeting for kids. And that's where I received the Holy Spirit. It was dark out and the moon was bright and all of these other kids my age, I seen giving their lives to the Lord and crying and receiving the Holy Spirit and um, actually now that I'm telling the story there was one girl I think she was in the cabin next to us that freaked out um, she was screaming and crying and hysterical and she was yelling um, there were like camp staff that all came rushing over to her and she was screaming at them and cussing at them and telling them 
not to say the name of Jesus and she didn't want to hear that name. She didn't want nothing to do with the blood of Jesus and I don't remember everything, but it was scary. And some of the other kids were saying she was possessed and I don't know, maybe she was, I don't know. But that church camp that week was very impactful to me. It showed me that my relationship could get closer to the Lord. And, and you know what kind of, now that I think of it, it showed me that there was strength in numbers with the other kids there and being united. We felt united and um, at one. And it was such a beautiful experience. Um, it was just so amazing. So I came back from church camp, I'm very excited. And the church that we went to in our little tiny town in Oklahoma, it was Calumet, Oklahoma. Um, a family from TBN came as guests to our church and it was the Tripp family. I don't know if any of you remember the Tripp family, but I actually, where is it? I actually had a crush on Terry Tripp, and that was the youngest son. And hold on, let me show you. And here's my my old Bible from back then. This thing is just really falling apart, I'll tell you. I actually got him to sign my Bible. You see that? <laughs> I was so excited because somebody from TV came to our church and it was exciting. Moving on, um, my mom was going through, um, well, we ended up moving back to Washington and my mother had gone through another divorce and there were a lot of those. Um, and she remarried my dad. So my parents were married and divorced when I was probably about three or four. And then they remarried when I was 12. When we moved to Washington, back to Washington, that is when my life started going downhill fast. It was like everything got dark and I don't know how else to describe it other than that my whole world got dark. We had moved so many times in my life that um, I think the shortest period of time that I ever went to one school was one week. So we moved a lot and I'm, I'm, I think the longest period that I ever went to one school was two years so it was it was a struggle I, constantly starting a new school sometimes i didn't have enough time to even make friends before we moved again so i wasn't i was never excited to move because of that and struggled through until we moved to the town that I live in now, actually, I never, when, when my husband and I got married, I never thought that I would move back to this town, but this is the town that I lived in as a baby. Up until, before we moved to Oklahoma, this is the town that we lived in in Washington. And we started, I started school here, and this is where I met a lifelong friend, and her name is Kim. And I was 12 when I met her and she was my best friend. And uh, coincidentally, I also met my husband in middle school then. Um, we weren't really interested in each other then. Um, actually, my sister was in love with him for two years. <laughs> he wasn't interested in her, but she was you know, infatuated with him. Um, but so I had this best friend and it was a confidant and she helped me. It, it made it easier going to the school. And at some point my 
mom didn't approve of her. Um, I think she thought that my uh, thought that she was trying to get my dad's attention, and <clears throat> I think I think Kim was eleven at that time, so it was kind of. I remember feeling like it was an excuse um, for me to not have this friend. So we were banned from calling each other on the phone or spending the night at each other's house. And actually, Kim had wrote me a letter. We seen each other every day in school, but she had wrote me a letter and I got it in the mail and I got in trouble because she wrote me a letter. I wasn't allowed to have this friend anymore. And it just, it seemed like from that point on, it was a fast decline. I wasn't allowed to go to dances. I wasn't allowed to go to football games. I wasn't allowed to do anything. Art was my release. And I started kind of getting into darker things with my art. So I was actually going to the high school in the seventh grade and tutoring the high school students in the art class. So. I was good at art and it was the only thing that I was good at, but I was definitely moving towards drawing darker things. Um, although that is around the same time that I had received a scholarship, I was 12, I received a scholarship to go to the Art Institute and it was in Minnesota, but somebody from Minnesota flew out here to interview me and I thought I was so special that somebody would fly to Washington to interview little 12 year old me to go to this, to be able to have the opportunity to go to this art school. And it was correspondence, it would have been correspondence and we would have had to pay for shipping and handling and my mom said no. I ended up quitting school at 15. Um, there was, drama seemed to find me. It was just everywhere. So I ended up quitting school and I got a job and I decided that I was going to save all of my money. I was gonna earn my own money and save it so I could go to the school. And at this job, I was getting a lot of attention from a 28 year old man. Um, and I thought that I was pretty special for you know somebody that much older to be interested in me. I, I must have been very mature. I must have had something special about me. This is what I thought. Looking back on it, I couldn't have been more stupid. So I ended up running away from home to escape. This man introduced me to a completely new lifestyle. Um, I started him and his brother and their group of friends played Dungeons and Dragons a lot. And there was a lot of art in these books, um, like manual type books. So while we were playing these games, I would draw. I would draw pictures and they were, you know, a, kind of like the characters that we made. That was also the time that I became very involved in witchcraft that was introduced to me. So at this time, I just remember feeling a lot of freedom. Um, I started smoking cigarettes and, you know, introduced to alcoholic drinks. Um, but the art in these books is what drew me in and it was completely different than anything that I had ever known up until this point in my life. And like I said, it was freedom. Let me tell you, the, the spells that are cast in the game Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of those spells, a lot of the gods that they serve, a lot of the demons that are named those are all the same ones in witchcraft because I remember comparing this spell is in my witchcraft book. It's the same. These demons are in my witchcraft book. These gods are named. These, it was, it was everything just so you know, it's not just a game. Dungeons and Dragons is not just a game. It really has real spells, real 
activity and things happening the same as in witchcraft. Witchcraft gave me a sense of power and control that I never had before. I never had control over anything. And now all of a sudden I did. But I felt a sense of pride that I was able to do these things that other people couldn't do. And I knew things that other people didn't know. And I could make things happen. So as strange as this might sound, this actually fed my anger that had built up in me. It fed my bitterness and the rejection that I felt. It fed it and it grew. I wanted them to fear me. I wanted them to be sorry that they treated me that way. I seen a lot of scary things. Now I wanna make clear that I, I was never involved in anything that was sacrificing animals or killing animals or anything to do with blood or anything. That, it was nothing like that. It was nature magic is what I was. Um, and it was a very selfish. All of the things that I could do or make happen or, you know, it was all very selfish. It was all about me. I was trying to fill this emptiness that I had in me, this, this anger that I had in me, this self-loathing. I, I was trying to fill it with something to make me feel good about myself, to make me feel proud of myself. Now, I knew it was wrong. I knew that God's word said not to get involved in these things. I knew that. My mother was a Christian. And I remember growing up hearing her say, this person or that person doesn't like me because our spirits clash. Their spirit is at odds with my spirit. I thought she doesn't like me. It, you know, actions speak louder than words. She clearly did not like me. So obviously my spirit clashed with her spirit and I was bad. That's, that's what I had been taught. That's the impression that I had been given. And you know, if you, if you did something or called somebody out on something, you were cut off. And today they call it ghosting. And technically I'm being ghosted right now by multiple family members. Um, and that's how it hap would happen. It wouldn't be just one person. If one person ghosted you, everyone did. And, and that's to teach you a lesson. Not to call things out. Not to have a voice. So witchcraft gave me a voice. I figured if I was going to be the bad one, I might as well embrace it. I thought that that was my only option because no matter how much I tried to be good it was never good enough it was never I, I was never right I was always wrong so if I was trying my hardest to be good and it wasn't good enough why would I even try at all why, why waste my time trying at all? During those years, I started having sleep paralysis. You're awake, but you can't move, you can't talk. You feel like you're fighting with every ounce of your strength to stay in your body. And I don't know how to describe that, um, but that's what it feels like. like. Like something is trying to take you out of your body and you are fighting to stay. And, and it's an evil presence. The very fear grips you. And during one of those times, I had a near-death experience. I was 16. I felt like I was falling. Um, I opened my eyes. And just for like a split second, I could see myself. I was up in maybe the corner of the room and I could see down at myself, 
laying on the floor. I looked like maybe I was just asleep. Um, and there was a group of us in the living room watching TV. So, you know, they may have not even noticed. It was just for a split second that I could see myself there and I was flying backwards. It felt like I was falling, but I was going out of the, the room. I was moving extremely fast. Um, wherever I was, was extremely dark. I knew that I had left my body and I knew that I was going to hell. I knew that that's where, I knew I, I was falling and I knew that that's where I was going. And I started praying, I started begging, um, begging God to please not let this happen and that I was sorry. The fear that I felt was like, there. the word fear doesn't describe it. There's no human words that can describe that kind of fear because there's nothing on this earth that could produce that kind of fear. It was, it was so, I felt so lost. And by that, I mean that nobody knew where I was and would never be able to find me that kind of lost. Um, it felt the same as if someone had picked me up and put me in another universe. You, you would never know even where to look for me. I was so lost. That's the best way to describe how the, the strength of the word lost, I guess is what I'm trying to describe to you. There, the fear is like fear and panic and hysteria and horror and like a thousand times all of these words combined. I, there's no words that can describe that fear. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. Um, other than there was a sound of, it almost sounded like a rumbling sound. Um, it, it, it literally filled my ears um, and it was the only thing I could hear. It was so loud and it sounded like power, like how you would imagine power would sound like, uh, immense power. I, I literally cannot describe that sound like, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it. Um, and something that I did notice that really stood out to me was time. There, there was no time. And it, I, knew, I knew what it felt like for there to be no time. There, there was no sense of how long it had been. There was no sense of, I, I, and it's kind of another one of those things, I don't know how to describe the feeling of there not being time. Other than it felt natural to me, it felt that it felt more real than it does here. That felt more more real because here there is time and you can feel each second you can feel each minute and you're aware of it there there was no time there was no being aware of of each second or each minute there 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 was n just no time there was no beginning, there was no ending, there was no, nothing. But it felt normal, that felt 
that felt like that was real and this is a temporary time is temporary and i don't know how to describe it and i'm really trying to describe it for you all of a sudden i was back in my body and it was literally like a thud it was literally like i jumped like my body jumped and I got up, I got up off the floor and I still felt that fear. Um, I noticed that my shoulder was cold and it was just like, I knew that someone had had their hand on my shoulder. It was just like, you know, somebody has their hand on your shoulder or your leg, or maybe they're holding your hand and when they move it, it's cold because it had been warm. My shoulder was cold because somebody had had their hand on my shoulder the whole time and I didn't know it. And I, I knew, I knew that it was the Lord that brought me back. Maybe he allowed me to see it. I, I don't know, but I hate to say this, but it didn't change my life. How stupid would someone have to be for them for that to not change their life? But it didn't change my life. I continued in all of those things that I was doing. And every time there was a sleep paralysis, um, which I didn't even know that's what it was called then. I just knew that I literally something would come over me and I couldn't move and I couldn't talk and I would be screaming in my mind and fighting to move and then I would just break and I, I would be able to move. We ended up moving to Oklahoma, my that boyfriend and while I was there, you know, I continued in that same lifestyle and and met key people that taught me more so. I lived near Mama and Popo. And that, having Popo there reminded me who I was and he was always looking out for me and always taking care of me. And I decided I wanted to come back to Washington. I wanted to try to do right again. And I wanted my mom and Papa to be proud of me. So I wanted to leave that lifestyle and I wanted to come back to Washington and start over. So my mom and Papa paid for a bus ticket for me. And I remember Papa talking to uh, another Indian gentleman that was getting on the bus and Popo asked him to look out for me and told him that I was his youngest daughter. <laughs> Cause when I was little, I called him daddy Popo. So actually, oh, here it is. So I keep things in my Bible and Popo had kept this. So after Popo passed away, Momo gave me these things. So I had made this when I was little and it's in my Bible now, but you can see that I, I spelled it wrong, but that I called him daddy Popo. So I came back to Washington and stayed with my parents. Nothing had changed. And in fact, it was worse. So I was 16 at this point, And this is when I first got home. All of those things that I had not been allowed to do when I lived at home, my sister was doing. So it was kind of like a slap in my face. So I moved out and eventually ended up with that same boyfriend again. Um, the one that was an older man. At 18, I got pregnant and went through pregnancy, kind of hoping in the back of my mind that that would repair any sort of relationship but it didn't. Um, about a week 
before I had the baby, I had a dream that my mother took the baby and wouldn't give him back. I thought that that was absolutely crazy. I obviously my subconscious was really that that's how I viewed things. And, you know, maybe with pregnancy hormones added in there. So during this time, we were actually getting ready to move and was packing and we were going to be moving into the apartment building right next door. So instead of driving everything in a truck, we were just carrying it over by hand. And of course, I went into labor and had the baby in the beginning of December. My mom offered to watch the baby. And you know, it would be hard to carry a bunch of stuff, you know, carry stuff over and move with this baby. I agreed. We got moved and got everything set up and I called my mom to let her know we were on our way to come get the baby and she informed me that she was keeping him and not giving him back to me. And that she had already called CPS and told them that I was a Satanist and was gonna sacrifice the baby to the devil. Naturally, I was shocked beyond all belief because I had that dream for one and this must be some sort of joke because who, who would do that? Why would she do that to me? I can't imagine doing that to my daughter. I can't imagine doing that to a stranger, honestly. I jumped through all the hoops for CPS and um, I ended up getting him back when he was about eight months old. There was no bond between us. There was no connection whatsoever. He had bonded with my parents, obviously. You know, to make the long story short, I had been going through a divorce and we were fighting for the custody because I had a daughter at this point too. And we were fighting for custody and my mom stepped in and because when you're going, when both parents are fighting for custody, family court will step in and investigate both families and determine which is what's best for the children. So during that investigation, the courts gave both of my children to my mother. And that was great for my son because that's who he had bonded with, but not for my daughter because she she was well I'm not going to go into anything um but I had heard through my sister and other people that there was a lot of abuse and a lot of neglect and my daughter was because she looked like her dad was rejected and mistreated and the favoritism that happened between my sister and I had greatly intensified between my son and my daughter. So just for reference, my daughter was one and a half, and my son was three and a half. And that was hard for me to deal with because I had a bond with my daughter and that separation was the worst thing that I had ever gone through. By the end of court, um, I got my daughter back and she got my son. So my mother did raise that son. I did not have a lot of contact with him. I, I wasn't allowed. Um, he wasn't allowed to spend the night at my house or, or anything. She changed his, legally changed his name to hers. And um, I wasn't even allowed to correct him or discipline him if we were all, like there was a family get together or something. If I had even blinked at him wrong, there was a huge public scene um, and it wasn't just me. No one was allowed to discipline or correct him. So when I did get my daughter back, she would never smile ever. And also her hair was missing on top of her head. She wasn't completely bald, but it was very thin. You could see her scalp her hair had been pulled out. So that has been a huge struggle over the years. Um, that is That was a hard thing 
to let go of and to forgive. How, how do you forgive that? I have, with God's help only, because there was no way I could do that on my own. No way. So after that divorce was final and I moved on, I met a guy who introduced me to the party life. And that was kind of at the end of the court stuff. So it was a great distraction for me. Um, going to the clubs and dancing and, you know, I had gotten kind of away from the witchcraft because a lot of scary things happen with that. There's a lot of fear that follows that. Um, and that's probably something that you probably, you, you might not hear a practicing witch say, but the truth is that there's a lot of fear that you live with. So going to the clubs and partying and dancing and all of this, this lifestyle, it replaced the witchcraft. It gave me a sense of control and power and I got lots of attention and I could get whatever I wanted. And it filled that empty void that I had uh, temporarily. It was a temporary and it was every weekend um, it was my focus. That turned into singing. Um, going to karaoke with my sister is how it started. Um, because my sister had moved to the town that I had lived in and um, my ex-husband and I had rental houses and her and her boyfriend at the time rented the house right next door to us, uh, one of our houses. And so we had a relationship finally for the first time in our lives my sister and I had a relationship and our kids got to grow up together and we did a lot of family activities and rafting and camping and hiking and all of these things but it all it all revolved around alcohol and I never did drugs or anything like that that kind of stuff scared me so I was always too scared to try those things my ex-husband did do drugs and drank alcohol. He was a, a full-blown alcoholic. So that is what our lives consisted of. Um, but uh, like I said, we started going to karaoke and singing. And I chose Stevie Nicks songs because that's what suited my voice best. And I found out that I was good at it. So like I said, um, this is the first time that my sister and I had a relationship and this was something we decided to do together and alone. So it was, it was bonding for us. I would win every contest I entered, I would win and you know coming up against some really amazing singers and i i had groupies that would follow me wherever i was going and and singing at and i had job offers um i was offered the job to a job um in las vegas to be a stevie nicks impersonator and the costumes and the music started stirring up old feelings that kind of opened the door, reopened the door to witchcraft. And witchcraft is one of those things that for the rest of your life, it follows you. It might not be there all the time, but it will periodically come back and try to find an open door to come back in. And that was, that was an open door singing Stevie Nicks songs that talked about witchcraft and, and talked about um, magical things. I started to want a life change at that point in my life. I wanted something, something that I remembered from my childhood. I wanted that peace and happiness and that joy in my 
home. I wanted it for my children and remembering it from Momo and Popo's house. I wanted my house to feel like Momo and Popo's house. The drama always kind of stirred up when those things, when I would try to go to church. Um, but there, there were periods where I would go for quite a while and then I would slack off and you know, go to the clubs or just, I was kind of in a back and forth stage. Um, and then there were things that would happen in that house. Um, it, the, the marriage itself had a lot of domestic violence in it. And the home that we lived in was built in 1907. Um, and there were some strange things that would happen in that house. A lot of strange noises and, and, and things like that. So, and, it, and if you would talk about it, like it's maybe somebody had stopped by and you would talk about strange things happening in the house, a door would open by itself or slam by itself or you, there would be just weird things that would happen. And I remember one night my ex-husband had been in the wash house. The house was old enough that it had an actual wash house outside, um, which consisted of a wood stove and lines to dry clothes in like a little building. It had a concrete floor and an old, you know, washing machine in there. And he had turned it into more like a shop, but the wash house, he was sitting out there one night by himself and the kids were asleep. Um, it was nighttime. I was in bed watching TV and he came in the house and he kind of stood at the bedroom door and he didn't say anything. And I, I had asked, you know, what, what's wrong? And he kind of mumbled and he was, would start to tell me and he'd be like, oh, never mind, you won't believe me. And I was like, no, what, what is it? He would start to tell me and he'd be like, no, you'll say I'm drunk, you'll, you'll say I'm high. And so finally I got him to, to tell me what was going on. And he said he was in the wash house. Um, there was one little light on kind of behind him. And he was sitting in front of the wood stove and it was a, it was dark in there. And he said all of a sudden three ghosts came in the wash house and they were standing in front of him. He said that the one in, there was one in front and then two on the sides behind the, the one in front. And the one in front was kind of gray, like the outline of a person, um, but you couldn't see. It was just like the outline of a person, but like kind of like a gray smoke. And you could see its eyes. He said the two behind were black, like black smoke. And same thing, kind of the outline of a person and all you could see was eyes. And he said that they were trying to talk him into something. They were talking to him. And he said, but they didn't have mouths. And I said, well, because I'm thinking to myself, okay, likely story. Um, I said, well, how were they talking if they didn't have mouths? And he said, I, I don't know. He said, it was kind of like I could hear what they were saying in my mind. And he said, I, I would say to them, do you mean this? And all three of them would nod their head at the same time. He would, he would never tell me what they were trying to talk him into. I, never, he would never tell me. And he finally, he said, I, I told him I can't do that, I believe in God. And he said, right when he said God, this bright light came in the room and it, it was so bright he had to turn his head away and cover his face up with his hand because it was so bright. He said after a couple of minutes he he looked and, and it was all gone. The light was gone and, and they were gone, the ghosts were gone. And he started to come into the house to tell me and on his way in, one of them came back and stopped him and said, whatever you do, don't tell Tina. She's gonna say you were drunk. She's gonna say you were high and you imagined it. She's gonna say you passed out and dreamed it. Just don't tell Tina about this. 
and he went ahead and came in the house and and told me and I when he told me that I had such an anger rise up in me I didn't have fear at all I immediately went stomping outside into the dark alone. It was night. It was in the middle of the night. So I went stomping out in the dark through the yard out to the wash house and told them, how dare you? I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. I was really going to get him. And that's why they didn't want him telling me. Because they knew, I knew I had power in Jesus' name. And I don't know what they were trying to talk him into. But, but God intervened. God, that wasn't the only time he intervened at that time in my life. Like I said, there was a lot of domestic violence. And at one point, um, while the police were there, the police had taken me aside and told me, do you know that he's building a bomb in the basement? Or that he says he's building a bomb or, or, or something to that effect. And... I had just decided right there that I was leaving. And I had tried to leave many times before and I couldn't. And if I did, I I would I would end up coming back. I had worked enough that year to where I was getting um, a tax return. And usually when that would happen, I wouldn't get my tax return. It would go to my mother because she charged me child support. After the police left it, they wanted to know if I wanted to a file report um, for domestic violence. They were taking him to jail. I called my dad. Um, now, my mom and dad had divorced by this point. Um, that was my mom's sixth marriage. I knew that I had only a certain amount of time because this had happened so many times. I knew about the time period that I had to work with. Around that same time, I got a call from an apartment complex in the same town that my mother lived in. And this woman on the phone told me that my name had been put on the list um, for a low income apartment to be, to get an apartment there. My name had been bumped up to the top of the list and she was calling to see if I wanted the apartment and to move in would cost nothing because it was a low income apartment and they go by your income. So to move in, I could move in for free. I got a letter from the IRS saying that, or from child support saying that my child support had been paid off and that I was getting my tax return, that I could actually get it that year. My dad showed up and got me a U-Haul and people came over and they helped me pack and move all within this short period of time I think it was about maybe three days that three or four days that I had to work with and I don't care what anyone says for the rest of my life I know that God does not approve of divorce. But I also know that God is the one who got me out of there. He literally made everything fall into place for me to be able to leave and set, set it up exactly because that was only God could do that. No one on this planet could ever convince me that that was not God who did that. Everything lined up within such a short period of time for me to be able to leave to with money and a place to go and a way to get there. And there was a lot of drama after I left. Um, a lot of death threats and I, I ended up having to get a five year protection order. Um, but I, I moved to a new town 
started a new life and God stepped into my life and everything started to look a little brighter. During that time, I got on Facebook and Facebook will suggest to you all of your old school friends. Well, I met or re-met um, my friend Mike from, from middle school and we hit it off. Now, you know, something that I probably hadn't mentioned, that friend Kim that I had from middle school we stayed friends all of these years. Still to this day, she is my best friend um, and like a sister to me. And we've had our disagreements on things, um, mostly on our beliefs, um, because she's a Jehovah's Witness and I am not. <laughs> but we have agreed to agree on the things we agree on and not argue about the things we don't agree on. So our, our friendship is more important. And you know what, That's it, it comes down to adults talk to each other. And you know, I, I, had, I had witnessed so many people in my life and, and they still do this. They get mad at you and they ghost you and they block you out and they don't talk to you. Um, that's not healthy that that is not a healthy way and and even the bible says if you have a problem with someone go and talk to them hit it off with mike and we he was agnostic when we met um and his story is amazing we would talk for hours and hours and hours on the phone till you know late in the night and ask me questions about god and you know why I believe the things I believe and I never pushed anything on him. Was, I was slowly coming back into it, but I I guess Mike seen something in me that he wanted or was he that he was interested in, a faith in me that he was interested in, that he wanted to know more about. He ended up accepting the Lord and we ended up getting married and my life has changed so much literally it has flipped upside down from what it was then um and we've had our struggles um in the beginning our you know blended family did not blend um his daughter has a, a few different mental illnesses and they were, you know, pretty severe. She tried to kill us. During those dark periods of time, I I pressed in. I didn't pull away. I I seen God move in my life. He proved himself to me. I was going to pursue God and he had proven himself to me. He had proven that he had a plan for me. He had saved me. And I was so stubborn, I I just kept living my life for me. But he was patient and he proved to me that I I was worth being loved. I I was worth more than I thought that I was. You know, I'm reminded of two verses that really stand out to me. Um Number one is if your parents forsake you, if your mother or father forsake you, God will pick you up and take you as his own. And there's actually a little video clip that I want to insert. Um, I heard Sheila Walsh talking about the bummer lambs. And she used to be on the 700 Club years ago. Um, so I'll insert that clip, but real quick, the second verse that stands out to me and that I would consider my life verse is Romans 8, 28. And it says that God works all things for the good of those that love him and are called to his purpose. See the spring lambs. I would watch the little lambs being born and it's, it's the most beautiful sight, but every now and again, a ewe will give birth to a lamb and immediately reject it. And there's nothing the shepherd can do 
And if the shepherd doesn't intervene, then that lamb will die, not of hunger, but of a broken spirit. They call them bummer lambs. So the shepherd will take that lamb into his home and he'll care for it, feed it with a bottle. And once the lamb is strong enough, he'll put it back with flock. But in the morning when he comes out and he calls, sheep, 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 the very first ones to run to him are the bummer lambs because they know his voice. And I will be a bummer lamb until the day I die. So I definitely would consider myself also to be a bummer lamb. But, you know, I, I can see, looking back at my life, I can see all of the times that God was showing himself to me, was proving himself to me. All of those connections that were made. Not by me, but by him. And he made it a point and that he had a purpose for me. When I was really little... I remember my great grandma, who was the evangelist, and her good friend, who was also an evangelist, um, her name was Sister Petrie. I remember them praying over me and my sister once. Um, we had came to Washington to visit family, like for summer vacation, we had came to visit. And I think we were getting ready to go back to Oklahoma. Vacation was over and they were praying over us and we were Pentecostal. So these prayers were very charismatic and very moving and emotional. And, and that was comforting to me. Um, and I remember after they were done praying, I don't remember which one of them, but one of them had said, one of these girls has a great call on her life. I'm sorry. <laughs> he said that, one of us, God had a, a great work for one of us. And I never, I remember feeling the Holy Spirit. I remember feeling the presence of God then. Gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I never, I never thought God would want me. I never thought that that was me. I was the bad one. And why would God want a bad person? What made the biggest change in my life uh, was two things. When I got baptized, I was prophesied over that night. The, the, the people didn't know that I had just been baptized that day. And The Lord started using me in different ways from that night on. When I really started pressing in and reading my Bible and not being just a superficial Christian, not just going to church on Sunday and then doing whatever I wanted for the rest of the week, I, I grew closer to him. I got to know him better. And a real relationship began. A parent-child relationship. And I definitely needed that. I have a parent that I can go to now that loves me no matter what. I don't have to prove myself to be loved. I don't have to earn his love. I, I can make mistakes and he'll still love me. I can ask him anything and he'll teach me. And I have security and peace and, and joy in my life. And it's bright. <laughs> so probably the biggest thing that I've discovered through this is my past did not define me. I was trying to build something on my own, happiness on my own. I was trying to find power and control over things that I had no control over. But the truth is, there is no power greater than God. And there is no way to change those things 
but through the blood of Jesus. And his blood washed me clean. All of those bad things have been washed from me. They don't define me. I rededicated my life to him and fully gave myself to him. I've never struggled with sleep paralysis since then. It's never came back. Um, I don't worry about what people say anymore. I And I used to. I never thought that I could have this happiness in my life. I never thought that I could feel the contentment that I have now and the acceptance that I feel. And I, I don't have to worry. I know that I'm loved. Nothing can compare to that happiness, to that peace and joy that only God can bring. And now at this point in my life, I know what that means. It doesn't mean the same thing that it does in the world, that peace and happiness and joy means. It's completely different. They shouldn't even be the same words because they're completely different when God gives it to you. So I hope this video helped somebody. Um, I am always available to talk with or pray with you. Um, you can find me on Facebook under my name, Tina Louise Golick. I hope that uh, that this video helped you. Maybe if it if it doesn't, maybe if it if it isn't for you, maybe it's for somebody in your circle. Maybe it's for somebody that you know that struggles with these things because. If I can get past the rejection and the self-hate and not being worthy enough, if, if I can get, if I can forgive all of those things that have happened to me, I know that God could help anyone get past those things because I was a, I was probably about as bitter and angry as a person could possibly be. So if he could help me, I know he could help anyone. So anyway, you guys have a great day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.